Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Now, today's episode is about collective agents. In 1999, the U.S. Department of Justice sued several tobacco companies for having misled the public about the risks of smoking. Now, the outcome of this landmark case? In 2006, the U.S. Court of Appeals found big tobacco liable for fraudulently covering up the health risk associated with smoking and for marketing their products to children. Now, one thing to think about this litigation is the parties involved in it and the actions that they do. You have the US DOJ suing and holding big tobacco culpable for misleading the public about the hazards of smoking. But how can US DOJ and big tobacco do such intentional actions? Are they even capable of doing anything in the first place, let alone be culpable or responsible for any action? Now, to talk about the ontological status of these collective agents and why it matters, we have Holly Lawford Smith, Senior Lecturer of Political Philosophy at the University of Melbourne and the author of Not in Their Name, Are Citizens Culpable for Their State's Actions? Hello, Holly. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so before getting into our main topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. So how did you get started in philosophy? Um, I was actually doing a fashion design degree in Dunedin in New Zealand. Okay. And so I had like plenty of stuff to do, like creative with your hands wise, but I was feeling a bit bored intellectually. Um, so I actually enrolled in just some, um, I think I was just doing two or maybe two papers a semester or something in the lunch breaks of of the design school. And one of the papers I took at random was an ethics paper from the philosophy department. Um, mm -hmm. And I just got totally hooked. Like I really liked the lectures. I liked the, um, I don't know what you call that. Just like the constant state of chaos where you think, <laughs> oh, that seems invasive. And then you come back the next week and the lecturer is like, all of that doesn't work for the following reasons. Uh. Here's the next <laughs> and get really persuaded by that. And then the next week. <laughs> so yeah, I really loved it. And I, I wrote an essay and I got a really high grade, which I think probably you know, as lecturers, um, we always wonder how significant that is. And at least for me, I was like, oh, here's something I must be really good at because I got a good grade. <laughs> but when I went from there, I just really loved it and kept taking more papers and eventually changed my whole like um, course of study so that I was majoring in philosophy. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting. So you you went to fashion school, design school, then you went to an ethics lecture. Now you are a philosopher. So yeah. who... Who influenced you in your political think, uh, in your philosophy, in thinking about philosophy? Um, well, the department at Otago was really great. It was quite a small and close department, maybe eight or so lecturers at the time. Mm -hmm. And this, the undergrads, I remember being very um, like welcome and involved even in the staff seminar. So I remember going to the weekly seminars when I was about second or third year I think and you know understanding nothing like I remember Colin Chain giving a talk about mathematical Platonism maybe it was and and like he seemed really puzzled by how you could get a bunch of bananas and know that there were five and I just remember <laughs> sitting there like what are they talking about <laughs> I think because there was this real culture of like people being together and you sort of see how it's done and learn how to do it and you have really supportive mentors and lots of encouragement and mm -hmm. um, I don't know so maybe there weren't really anyone in particular it was just a really great department and very supportive and um, yeah so just yeah yeah so and you went to the Australian National University for your PhD yeah yep I did my undergrad and my honours and my master's at Otago and then I applied to um, ANU for PhD and then ended up over there which was also great. Like I know you've spent time there as well and we're both fans of many of the staff. There. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was another just really great, very collegial, very supportive um, mm. atmosphere and just like loads going on. I remember when I was thinking about which department to go to and kind of getting advice from people, Josh Parsons at the time called the ANU philosophy heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
reading groups and talks and then there's dinner after the talk and then there's Friday drinks where you still talk about philosophy and it's like all philosophy all the time which yeah. probably, if you don't love philosophy it probably sounds terrible but if you do <laughs> like it's great so you get that full immersion experience of just like thinking and talking about that stuff for three and a half years non-stop um, <laughs> so 24 7 philosophy right yeah <laughs> <laughs> for a whole week doing just philosophy then you went exactly. to uh, University of Sheffield for a job? Yeah, that was my first permanent job. So I had a couple of short postdocs at ANU and so kind of hung around there for a little bit after I um, submitted my thesis. And then, yeah, my first proper job was in Sheffield. So I moved there for, I think it was about four, four, four and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, and I, I don't think I was a perfect fit for the UK, maybe, or maybe like smaller town UK. I just, I always just felt like a bit of a weirdo and like a bit of a, I don't know, just culturally, it just didn't feel like a great fit. Um, so I was getting a little bit itchy after about four years and then just got really lucky timing wise. I think I was back at the ANU doing like a research visit mm. and I, I got an email from someone at Melbourne like, oh, hey, is there any chance you're open to moving back? And I was like, yes, so open. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that all just seemed to like work out miraculously well. Um, okay, but what led you to specialize in political philosophy? Um, I actually think that was a bit of a conveyor belt thing as can sometimes happen in philosophy. You know, you take one thing and then you get a bit interested in that and, and you, I don't know, you kind of just go from there. So I, it's not like I took a lot of political philosophy in undergrad and knew that I really loved it. Mm. Um, I did an honors dissertation on like science fiction and whether science fiction books are thought experiments. So that's not really political philosophy, that's kind of methodology. Um, and then I did a, a, a master's thesis on like toleration. So kind of, I guess that's in a sense, classical liberal theory, political philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I kind of did quite a methodology PhD. I don't really even know how that happened. I remember being really interested in what implies can, um, but then somehow I ended up writing this thesis that was really like just trying to make sense of what it even is for something to be a feasibility constraint. I don't have any good narrative in my mind of like why the hell I ended up <laughs> that topic really. I don't think, yeah, no particular reason. And I think a lot of what I do is actually applied ethics, mm -hmm. but I'm somehow called senior lecturer in political philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know I I don't know if I have a good story about why I think I d dabble in a lot of things and um just somehow that's the name of my job um yeah, yeah. because yeah because your book let's go to your book not in their name uh, are citizens culpable for their state's action it's a political philosophy book yeah it's kind <laughs> of political well it's political philosophy mixed up with social ontology I guess and then so you can sort of you have a lot of latitude in that space, I think, because you can you can care more about the metaphysics and get really into like what is a group intention, mm -hmm. or you can get into the what are the legal implications of groups doing bad things together, or what's the ethics of being a member of a group and then being responsible for what other people do. So there's like a lot of space, I think, to keep dabbling. But but I agree, like a lot of my focus there was on the state and like how citizens relate to what their states do. But it was sort of also secretly smuggling in quite a lot of just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of technical <laughs> philosophy. Okay, so your approach to this book, yeah, as you have mentioned, is to use social ontology to answer some social and political issues. But what is social ontology first? Yeah, so I think about social ontology as like the bridge between metaphysics and ethics. Mm -hmm. So you have kind of what I would call like straight or classical ontology as part of metaphysics, which is just all these questions about what exists, um, uh, what kinds of things there are, but it tends to focus on material stuff. Um, and there tends to be a lot of discussion about levels, like higher order and lower order stuff, like are there just atoms or the smallest smallest things or are there like medium-sized dry goods as philosophers <laughs> like to say like the the tables and the chairs and um that if you keep going up from there and you get to individuals you can also get to clusters of individuals and I think that's 
where it becomes social rather than just um, a question of what exists in the purely material sense. Mm. So social ontology is like the the social aspects of groups of individuals together. So like all sorts of groups like teams, sports teams, churches, institutions, the state, um, supranational entities, and then also like social stuff that um, we kind of construct or create together. So things like the law or money or institutions, um, stuff where there's some sense in which they're like made out of our beliefs, social right. beliefs. And I think the reason I say that's the social ontology is a kind of bridge between metaphysics and ethics is that um, as soon as you have these questions about individuals together or what individuals' beliefs together create, you get all these interesting ethical, legal, um, uh, political questions straight away. Because of course you then have intentions and you have control and you have ability to do otherwise. So all the like moral questions come out of that. Like how do we do wrong together? Or, um, you know, maybe we constructed, uh, you know, femininity, for example, it's like a social construction, but then, but if it's a social construction that oppresses some people, then we might want to talk about whether we can construct it differently or or deconstruct it. So all these ethical questions kind of follow um, uh, immediately. But I, I'm teaching a course at the moment called the metaphysics of ethics. And I often use social ontology in that middle position. So it's like you can do straight metaphysics and then you can like bridge it through something like a corporation like mm -hmm. you did at the start of this um, discussion, right? You talked about big tobacco. So it's like, you can tell that story and then you get to all these questions like, do we sue them? Like who's who's the baddie? Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I think about it. No, uh, okay, so I like the picture here. So social ontology is like a bridge, as you call it, from metaphysics to ethics, something like Frank Jackson's book. But here's the idea. So there are different ontological accounts of what collective agents are. Could you tell us some of these accounts and what's your preferred account? Yeah, sure. Um... So, yeah, I guess as in any philosophical area, there's like competing accounts of things on offer. So this is uh, in the area where we're interested in clusters of individuals acting together or mm -hmm. potentially having um, shared kind of beliefs or intentions feeding into their action. Um, I sort of, the way that I like tend to approach this question is to like organize the various accounts on offer in terms of um, whether they make it like easy or hard for a group to count as a collective mm -hmm. agent, if that makes sense. Um, so um, when I talked about this for the purposes of the book, I just kind of segregated a bunch of different accounts into like really weak, moderate and strong. And so the strong accounts were like, it's really hard to count as a group um, if we think about groups that way. So um, I think it's uh, Christian List and Philip Pettit, for example, have a really strong account where they require that to count for a group of individuals to count as a collective agent, which they think about as something like having a mind of its own. So really being something that's like an individual in some meaningful sense. They want the group to meet a bunch of conditions um, that I'll talk about soon, but also be capable of being autonomous and rational, mm -hmm. which is like, because they have a lot of um, discussion about ways in which groups can kind of um, contradict themselves over time and then be what we would call irrational if we saw, if we saw it in individuals. So that's like a really, I think, strong and I think overly strong way of thinking about what it takes to be a group. And there's some reflective equilibrium necessary here because if you're too stringent about what it takes, you're going to get very few groups. Mm -hmm. But if you need groups in order to think about um, collective culpability, you want to be like going back and forwards a bit, figuring out like, d don't be too lenient because then you just let everything in, but mm -hmm. maybe be a bit lenient so that at least it's not only the two people painting a house together that can never be responsible, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I kind of, um, I think that's a bit too strong. And then on the other side, um, there's accounts that I think are probably a bit too weak. So uh, Christopher Kutz, for example, um, 
has an account where it's sort of more about what any individual contributor, how they think about their actions. So for example, say um, I just decided that I'm not going to buy sweatshop t-shirts, but the way I see my action is like, um, I, I don't buy, uh, say I buy like an expensive organic bamboo t-shirt and I conceive that as a contribution to our collective project of boycotting sweatshops. And then for him, I think that's actually enough, like all of us with this particular kind of intention, we see our actions in a particular way, we could be conceived as, in some sense, a like weak, like a weak sort of a collective. I mean, I don't think he thinks it's weak. I think he just thinks that's the right account. <laughs> um, but I think that's too weak, right? Because then anyone anywhere can just sort of opt in like the group doesn't have any control over its membership um i mean maybe the most useful parallel there is just something like a social movement so if you just think of like um you know any prominent movement at the moment like the the me too movement or black lives matter it's like people can get a sense of what's going on there but then you've just got some like weirdo in their living room who decides they want to be part of that thing too and then they just mm. I don't know so I feel like Kutz's account will allow anyone can just decide that their action is a contribution to this collective end and then somehow the rest of the group is like on the hook for what this weirdo decides to do even if they really act badly or um whatever so I think that's too permissive and then I sort of think there's a there's a just right somehow story in the middle which is like moderate accounts and they're going to tend to have something like um having a decision procedure that makes you capable of acting over time on the basis of group intentions or beliefs like that's very very rough um but that's adapted from people like Michael Bratman or Margaret Gilbert but turning their accounts into something that's more uh, agent like and more um, like more singular I guess is the important thing to say because they tend to think about collectives as plurals and I tend to think about collectives as singular entities that are just like individuals in some way so that's how I see the kind of landscape um, of different accounts and then of course there's all more complicated things to say about exactly how each one works but I'm sure they don't matter here <laughs> okay so you have uh, a really strong account, like a petted account, which it's like uh, social collectives are more like emergent things, right? In, in that sense. So it's over and above the individuals that compose it. Yeah, I think so. Like on the strongest version for them, um, like the group would really have to have a mind of its own. Like yeah. it has to be capable of coming up with decisions that just that aren't the same as any of the members decisions mm. so it's a lot like you really have to have a strong procedure in place to be able to achieve that like they talk about things like you know if an electorate makes one decision one year and then the next year they decide something that completely contradicts that um they would want it to be the case that somehow the group can resolve that tension like it can flag that there was a irrationality and then do something to bring its beliefs into into consistency so right. it's like it's a lot right <laughs> that's too demanding then you like, have... I can't even do that. Like... <laughs> <laughs> okay so there's the other side which is weak in your sense that anyone could be part of the group so if i participate in the Black Lives Movement or Me Too Movement, I'm part, already part of the group. And you're saying that that's too weak because, well, anyone <laughs> or any group would apply as a collective agent. That. Yeah, I think it's too weak. Yeah, in your account, you have the Goldilocks account. Let's, let's call it that. So uh, I read somewhere that you're, you're prescribing four conditions for collective Asian. So you have, yeah, you mentioned it, you have a decision procedure for the group. You have a unifying a unifying thing. So you, you refer to the group as one thing, as a singular thing. Yeah. You also have a persistence condition requirement. What is that about? Yeah, this has been like a source of much disagreement between me and, you know, the, the rest of the social ontology gang. <laughs> <laughs> Right. This is an interesting question, right, which is like, what's the difference between joint action, which is like a one-off thing, and then being 
being an agent, like having agency, I think agency must persist over time, right? So it wouldn't be enough just for people to have some constellation of intentions that made them capable of doing one thing together. Yeah. If they just did one thing and then dissolved, I don't think, I mean, one thing you could say is, yeah, that's just a really quick agent. <laughs> it's like a, a human just like pops into existence, does one job and then dies. Mm -hmm. And so you could think that if you think that, then, then I'm wrong. And then you don't need persistence. But I think the more sensible view is like, if it's going to be an agent at all, it's going to have to be capable of action over time and mm -hmm. sort of formulating intentions and beliefs and making decisions in a way that um so i think it can't just be a one-off thing it's got to be like multiple actions over some period but then you get all these weird but like how long's long enough like if if a group forms and it does i mean i was in a lot like a lobby type group last year and we probably lasted two months mm. you know so we formed we lobbied and then we died. <laughs> like, and is that, I mean, I think that was an agent for a while, right? Because it was a small group. It had all the right sorts of procedures and intentions and deliberative stuff in place, but it was quick. So it was like, you know, I guess if you had a, a baby and the baby didn't live for very long or something, like you can have short lived humans, mm -hmm. but you can't have like one time, one action <laughs> humans. So, but it's interesting because this is like, um, I'm having this, discussion at the moment with one of my co-authors she's trying to figure out how to think about um like dormancy in collective agents so it's like mm. if you have a corporation and the way the corporation acts is through its members what do you do when everyone's off the clock mm. you know so it's like is is that a corporate agent where it's like alive for four hours a day and then it's like <laughs> dead for a while and then it's like, you know so there are these questions it sounds kind of silly, but it's like to persist 24 hours a day, or mm. can we come up with some alternative story about the persistence of agency in the case of collectives where it doesn't have to be continuous? Mm -hmm. And so then if you get this like dotted line mm. rather than a continuous line like we have for individuals, like how does that change our conception of, of agency? So I think there are all these kind of complicated questions about should we always be using it, the individual human as ruled out or do we just think about corporate agency differently and then and then if, if one off is if we can all agree that one off actions is too short how much is, is enough like mm. just at, at least two um <laughs> yeah so it, it's kind of complex but i think i'm pretty confident that like more than just one action um is required yeah yeah, that's interesting because you could apply some sort of metaphysical theory here. So you have like temporal parts view and the rest of persisting uh, metaphysics of persistence theories. You have another condition that is uh, in terms of membership. Mm -hmm. So one thing about that is that you could be a member of one group and a member of another group, but that does not really uh, go against you being a member of a group well, what is that condition all about yeah i think this i mean this is an idea that margaret gilbert had earlier um although again she's sort of thinking about groups in this pluralities way i think rather than the singular um collective agent way mm -hmm. but the thought was just if we really think what's important is the structure of the shared intentions or shared beliefs in the way that those feed into action then it's possible that you can get two groups that have the same material condition. And so they're, it's like me, you, because we can be the, um, the people who do interviews together group and then also the, um, the Australasian Association of Philosophy Committee or mm. something. Um, so it's like, because all this psychologized stuff is the stuff that matters for making a group exist or not, you can have overlap in the material stuff, which means you can also have overlap in the location. Mm -hmm. So the two groups can be located in the same place at the same time, which would seem to violate some of the more classical metaphysical mm -hmm. um, 
requirement. So it's a bit weird, um, but I think it's probably right. And so I can be a member of many different groups so long as I meet the conditions for counting as a member, like I've voluntarily chosen to be a part of that group or I intend for its procedures to bear on my decision-making in a particular way. Um, in a sense, there's no limit to how many groups I can be a member of, although I will start getting conflicts in my obligations. Like, because if I'm pulled in six directions by six different groups and there's no settling, like, who do I owe my primary allegiance to? Um, they, you get some difficult ethical questions there, I think. Okay, so let's go there. Let's go to the, the, the problem about culpability and responsibility. So here's a two-pronged question. How do we ascribe responsibility and culpability to collective agents? And how should we do it? Yeah, good questions. Um, I don't know if we do it in the same way in, the, in, in every place. And maybe I haven't thought about that enough because as philosophers go, we don't tend to be that good at facts. Um, <laughs> but I guess I, off the cuff, I would say we tend to look for higher up scapegoats. Mm. I don't know if that sounds right to you. Um, that we tend to kind of look for the CEOs and the, the people who had the, the decision-making power um, at the top of a corporation or uh, an institution or the public service. Um, and I don't know if that's because we really have a folk view that that is the person who deserves it um, or if just it's really complicated to try to hold, you know, maybe it's the sort of pragmatic thing, like, well, you can't really put all the employees on the hook or you can't really, you know, like that's all too hard. So at least we'll just do this symbolic thing. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's probably what we do do. Maybe it's a bit different the less organized the group is. Um, so I can imagine for smaller groups, like uh, if you think about things like mafia gangs or mobs or um, yeah, just, you know, get like gangs, like groups of friends that just go out being violent and there's just four of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess in cases like that, we might be more inclined to be egalitarian about it and just think like everyone that was involved is responsible. But I think for large, complicated institutional agents that have a hierarchy, we do tend to sort of like pin it on the top um, person. And second part was how we should, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, so um, I guess I've thought most about the state uh, and less about other organizations like um, yeah, churches or teams or universities or whatever. Although I think probably roughly the same model would, would generalize. Um, the thing that I was most concerned about in, this, in the case of the state was whether or not to like include the citizens or the people as part of this entity where I was thinking about it being responsible. So like step one is always, is there a collective agent here or mm -hmm. only some kind of less organized, messy cluster of people? If it's messy, then we're only able to really think about responsibility in terms of individuals. If there's a collective agent, then we can sort of ascribe culpability at the level of the group. So we can really say, um, you know, it was the Australian state that did this terrible thing, or it was this particular tobacco company that's responsible for all this um, death or disease. Mm -hmm. And then there's this further question after that, once you attribute culpability to a collective agent, in what way may you or must you distribute that responsibility among the individual members who make it up? Um, so in the book, I defend a uh, step one, a citizen's part of the state, no. Um, mm. Step two, is there anything in the vicinity of the state without the citizens that is a collective agent? Yes, it's the extended um, governance structure, which is going to be like the whole public service, all the elected officials, the army, the police, and so on and so on. So you have this big structure. I can't, I did the numbers at some point, but I haven't read it in a while, so I don't remember <laughs> what they are. Maybe some couple of hundred thousand employee uh, employees in the Australian case. Mm. I think it's something like that. Um, so that's the structure. It is a collective agent. Uh, and then I defended something like a, um, 
uh, even remember what I called it, like a um, hierarchical distribution. So everyone in that group gets some share of responsibility for what the collective did mm -hmm. in the cases where that was bad. But people who have um, are higher up in the organizational hierarchy get more. And that was supposed to be just sort of re responsive to this thought, which I think is probably what we have in the case where we just pin it on the CEO mm -hmm. colloquially, that like people who are higher up in a structure, they have more downward um, authority to like delegate and control what the organization does. So you want it to be that the higher up you go, the more responsibility people have. Yeah. But I also thought it was important to acknowledge that corporations, states, um, collectives in general, they are able to act and achieve their ends through their individual members. So we are, whenever we're like, you know, acting as the Australian state, as an MP or a public servant, or we put on our, you know, we work for Vodafone and we put on our Vodafone polo shirt or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, we are enacting the the collective's ends. And so that's important as well. Um, mm -hmm. But it's interesting because it does lead to all these other complicated problems about, um, you know, one problem, which I don't really think I took up in the book, but but I have some other papers on was like, it just looks weird that someone can like, say you've got your four people that we talked about earlier and then they do a crime, mm -hmm. then that's, if that counts as a collective agent, it will be um, culpable for what it does. But now say like you quit and decide you want to do something else now and some other person joins. Mm -hmm. Now, if the, you're out and this new person is in, and that just looks kind of counterintuitive. Um, but it also looks counterintuitive if we say, well, it's always you and the other three, even once you've disbanded, because that just looks like we were never actually taking seriously this thought that it was a singular collective agent and it in its own right is culpable. Um, it looks like we were always just pinning it to the individual members. And then we go back to this plurals view that some other people had. So yeah, there are these like, there's like weirdness no matter what you do, I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we are part of different collective agents. So our family, our locale, our university, our state. So are we culpable and responsible for what these collective agents are doing? Um, yeah, so I think, I think I, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I think you can be a member of multiple collective agents. So in yeah. principle, it's possible that you end up with a lot of culpability. I think there's interesting questions about which of the groups you just mentioned would count as a collective agent. So if yeah. I'm right or roughly right about, you know, what are the right accounts, like it's only the moderate ones. And then we held up each of these kinds of um, groups you mentioned. I don't think family would well, count, for example, yeah. or some people's family. Yeah, I think um, it matters whether the group that you're a part of, you had the choice to voluntarily um, sign up to it. Uh, mm -hmm. So your membership, I think in general, your membership has to be voluntary if you're going to be ascribed um, culpability. So... I think there are probably lots of family units where they, you know, through the enthusiasm of their joint planning and decision making and things they do together, you can read voluntariness off it, right? They could have opted out, but they didn't. So there are definitely going to be some family units that function like highly organized collective agents. Um, they're receptive to each other's preferences and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So some will count and some will not. And then things like locale, for example, like, I think probably Melbourne or um, I don't know, even like the, the my postcode or something, like those are not going to count. Maybe there's a complicated discussion to be had about like local vote, you know, like local council elections and stuff, but it will be a similar discussion than I had in the book about whether just voting in an election once every four years at the state level is enough to implicate you, which I don't think it is. 
Mm. Um, I think probably the university is, but there'll be a parallel question about whether, so like in the case of the state where I really obsessed for a lot of the book about whether the citizens are in, I think it'll be the same for the university with the students. Mm. So there'll be a question like, are the students part of the university or is the university just like the staff, the people on the payroll, the mm. big decision makers, maybe the shareholders, I don't know. So there'll be a question there about who counts. And then it's like, if you're staff, then you're definitely in, but if you're just a student, then maybe not. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think pl plausibly, a lot of things we're involved in are collective agents. And so we have these multiple routes to culpability mm -hmm. um, through them. Mm -hmm. Definitely our workplaces, probably our, if we have any organized hobbies, like we're in sports teams and um, things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah and then I don't know what the practical upshot is really maybe it's just like be warned you might get a slice of the pie of culpability at some point like if it turns out your group was doing some shitty thing and no <laughs> one was like you know what I mean like you didn't right, have the right. right procedure to safeguard against it or um it might mean that you should be a bit more vigilant about what those groups are doing and, and do the best you can um, to, to make sure they don't. Like, so there'll, there'll be some practical implications like that, I think, the, the more you find yourself a member of. Um, it seems like we are yeah, responsible if, as well, right? For what the, the group is doing. Yeah. Is that, yeah, is that the story here? So for example, because I'm part of the university and my university oppresses women, so I'm partly responsible for that because I'm allowing it. Mm. Is that the, the, the story here? Yeah, I think that's like, A, it's just a sort of colloquial intuition that we have. Like mm. I certainly have that intuition. If you're part of it, you're responsible. Mm -hmm. And then I think some of this stuff in social ontology gives us the resources to be like, well, hang on a minute, let's just check. <laughs> like, you know, so maybe it turns out your university, like, is just completely unreceptive to staff, for example. So mm. that I think that could happen. It could turn out like, who really gets any say in the decision procedure? Okay. And then there's an interesting question, right? Because some would have a really weak account um where like you know a corporation has a what do they call them those like boxes where you can drop suggestions in like, suggestion box um, <laughs> so someone might think that that's <laughs> <laughs> that's a shocking uh, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so like that you might think that's to have like a voice in the decision procedure is just being able to make a suggestion. Mm -hmm. But say it turned out you wanted something stronger than that. Like it really had to be that if you dissented, there's a real turn and getting other people on board. I can imagine a case where a university just didn't meet those conditions, right? Mm -hmm. And then maybe almost all the staff are off the hook and the only people who would count as the collective agent there are like the, the VC and the VC's cronies, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it just kind of depends, but I think in any sort of open, fairly democratic, like what I hope universities are like, then, <laughs> then I think you would as a staff member be on the hook, um, yeah. Okay, so what can you say about what's Sorry. going on? Hello. So what can you say about what's going on in the U.S. now, United States, the Trump-Biden uh, election? I don't know if I can say anything. What do you have in mind? <laughs> no, so I'm thinking, are citizens responsible for what the turnout in the elections may be? So that's a perspective. Uh, so we have a democratic society like the US, you, you participate through elections. And if the winner is someone bad, is it the responsibility of the citizen? Are citizens culpable here? Yeah, I think on my view, no. Mm -hmm. um, because I just, ex I don't think that, I don't think citizens end up being members of the state in a meaningful enough way. Mm -hmm. because I don't think in a representative democracy just being allowed to cast a vote 
among a very limited set of options once every four years or whatever it is in your country um, is sufficient to counting like on any of these views as like participating or being involved in the right way in the decision procedure. Mm -hmm. I think there is probably still a separate question. So your question is a good one and for a moral philosopher, separate of whether there's like collective agency there. I think you could just say um, it's a it's one of this class of problems where a lot of us can cause a good or bad outcome from mm. acting together, right? And so it's just like the all of our emissions create climate change and all of our little bits of rubbish create pollution and, and you know, mm. all of us voting creates an electoral outcome. Um, I would tend to conceptualize it in that camp though. So it's more like, do I have an individual obligation to vote when I know it won't make a difference or to not emit greenhouse gases when I know it won't make a difference. But I know that if we all did it, it will be great. Mm -hmm. So I, I've been quite interested in that class mm -hmm. of problems. Um, and I think there are some interesting attempted solutions to those problems, but I also would tend to think about them separately. Like, in, like what is your obligation when it comes to an election like that? Um, I think that's going to be a separate question from whether once the election outcome is achieved and it's a terrible one mm -hmm. are you part of an agent that then like elected trump again and then is <laughs> on the hook for all this really bad stuff like mm -hmm. i think my view will say no uh, mm -hmm. and maybe that's a reason to reject my view right because maybe you think for fuck's sake like if those people aren't responsible who's responsible <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. they clearly did something right it's a joint action i think I just think that one-off joint action is not sufficient to collective agency. Okay, so that's for prospective actions. How about retrospective actions? How about reparation or something like the sins of our fathers and mothers? Yeah. Right. Okay, so in the case of Australia, you have an issue about indigenous or aboriginal uh, reparation. So are we still responsible, the present generation, for all those things that happened in the past? Yeah, this is so, this is really good. You're pushing me because it's like my, um, my like moral intuitions are yes. like, yes, <laughs> definitely, right? Like I want to say, of course, in the election case, we should vote for the non-asshole candidate. And of course, like as white Australians or, um, yeah, descendants of colonists, we have responsibilities for historical injustice. Mm -hmm. But I think my view produces the answer, no, we don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think that precludes, like, there's a little bit in the book where I, like, having set aside citizens being culpable for what their states do from the inside, I still talk about separately as individuals what responsibilities might they have so what responsibilities do we have as individuals given the ways that we might be um involved or implicated or able to make a difference relative to collectives so there are still interesting questions like you could try to say i have benefited as an individual from historical injustice in that I am more likely, so you tell a story about like light skin privilege, for example, would be one way to tell it. Or like if you have the right dialect or, you know, class background or whatever, you mm. might be able to access certain sorts of social networks or privileges or, so I think there's still lots you can say, but you just kind of have to say it individualistically. Like I am a beneficiary or I have certain things that I could do to make it more likely that that we realize the good. Um, mm -hmm. um, d does that make sense? So you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can still say things morally. But yeah, they're not going to be things to do with like being a member of a of a collective that itself did something um, wrong. Yeah, so I like that distinction here. So the state is responsible or culpable, but not the individual or the citizen here. Okay, so on a more personal note, what's your advice for those who want to get into professional philosophy? Oh, another good question. Um, 
God, it's hard to give advice during a pandemic, isn't it? Because yes. it's like yeah. I'm already feeling so <laughs> worried for my PhD students at the moment. Like, mm. what a terrible time to be emerging from a grad program and looking for work. Um, yeah. So, God, I don't even know if someone came to me and was like, I'm thinking about starting a PhD. <laughs> like, <laughs> God, yeah, I guess I would tell them, I would try to find out if they're, what are their reasons? Like if their reasons are that they just love philosophy, like we presumably do, then it's it's a good in itself, right? Just to get to do a PhD and have all this time to think. And um, it's a time in your life that you won't have once you start working, whatever that work is. So I would say go ahead. But if they said, oh, I just really see this as vocational. I would only do it if I knew I would be pretty certain to get a job. <laughs> I think I'd, I'd maybe advise against it, right? Because it's just such an uncertain market. And and the way that the pandemic's going to change teaching, like being able to get more teaching done online and get these superstars from Harvard to give your lectures as a guest, you know, like yeah. I don't know what's going to happen to the land yeah, yeah, of that's... universities and jobs and stuff. Mm. But do you think that a career so, in philosophy? Yeah. yeah, so do you think that a career in philosophy is worth it? I mean, I think it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like, I mean, what a privileged job, right? I often think that, like, there's some bad bits every now and then, like, you have to do marking and stuff. But, <laughs> um, you know, most of the jobs you can get, you're not teaching all the time, like, you're. It might be really in terms of time, even if you're teaching in every semester, it's probably not more than half the year. And the kind of um, luxury of just getting to read books you're interested in and papers and just learn stuff and talk to really smart grad students. And like, I don't know, as a lifestyle, I think it's an amazing job. It's just, um, yeah, A, if you have the temperament for that, like not everyone finds that stuff great. So it's like <laughs> for certain people that think that's that's wonderful. Um, and then just, yeah, if it's reasonably likely given our circumstances now that, that you can get a career, it might just be that we've been the last lucky ones for a while. I don't know. Yeah. Um, that maybe sounds a bit pessimistic, but that, that would be my, my worry. Okay. So would you say that your career is worth it so far? Oh, I like, I'm so happy. <laughs> it's just such a, yeah, for sure. It's an amazing, I mean, yeah, it's an amazing job. I really, really, really love philosophy. And yeah, I've met so many interesting people. And I guess it's a bit boring at the moment in the sense that part of the fun was all the traveling to a really cool conference and meeting some new people and getting heaps of feedback on your ideas. And so feeling really like everything's churning over all the time and it's really stimulating and exciting. And at the moment, it's more like, just sitting in your house the whole time <laughs> locked in <laughs> and then so like you get a lot of read and think but you don't necessarily get all the feedback and interaction that makes it a bit more fast and exciting mm. um and also I guess it's like a separate to the pandemic but in the last couple of years I've gotten involved in much more controversial philosophy and so that's been quite different as an experience as well because mm -hmm. before that it was just like <laughs> you give a paper you get lots of feedback that's the end whereas now it's like you give a paper there's an organized protest outside yelling about you <laughs> <laughs> so you're way more stressed out for it and then people call you a bigot online and like so um mm -hmm. yeah like maybe it'll also more relaxing again in two years when I have a different project um but yeah I wouldn't give it up if I if I didn't have to it's great okay so I won't get into the that stuff here in this interview. Yeah. Don't, don't worry <laughs> <laughs> okay so on that note what about you though? do you do you agree with that? hello sorry sorry I talked over you what I just I just wanted to know what about you do you do you agree about the career thing yeah, uh, for now, of course, you, you can't say what's going to happen given the pandemic. But the career, yeah, of course. Yeah. It's lovely meeting you guys at the ANU here, podcasting. And now we're doing philosophy online. It's yeah. terrific. It's a terrific job. But is it sustainable at this time? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, 
Okay, so on that note, thanks again for sharing your time with us, Holly. So join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers.